there are four different grid levels uh, in the European grid and uh, mainly all over the world. What you can see here, the highest uh, grid level is the transmission grid with a, a voltage of 220 or 380 kilovolts. Um, this grid level um, is used to exchange uh, electricity with other uh, grids of other countries or other regions. Um, the power generation on the right hand side comes from the very large power plants like nuclear power plants or very large uh, lignite or hard coal power plants with a capacity on a gigawatt level. So they feed their uh, electric power to this uh, directly to the transmission grid. Um, on the left hand side there is no consumption on this level so there is no um, consumer like industry who is taking uh, the electricity from this grid level. There are some countries which have even a higher uh, voltage level than 380 kilovolts um, like in, in Russia for example or in Canada with a voltage of up to 750 kilovolts. Um, this is due to the a distance you have to, to cover because the voltage gives you uh, roughly the distance you can uh, you can transport or transmit the uh, the electricity so uh, let's say 380 uh, kilovolts is about uh, 380 kilometers you can transport uh, the electricity before you need the next transformer station the second level is uh, the high voltage uh, with a voltage of 60 to 110 kilowatts. So we're on the distribution grid level. Uh, power generation comes from uh, mid sized coal power plants and the uh, hundreds of megawatts capacity, big gas power plants, or even large hydropower plants, which feed their energy directly to this uh, voltage level. On the left hand side, uh, we have the consumption. So, on the one hand, very big cities take the electricity. Uh, from this grid level and distribute this um, energy within this uh, the grid of the city and of course big industries like the steel industry for example they need a lot of energy so they directly get uh, the electricity from the high voltage grid. The third level of the grid is uh, the medium voltage distribution grid with a voltage of 6 to uh, let's say 30 kilovolts so on the power generation side we have typically uh, wind turbines, uh, PV systems or power energy systems which feed into the medium voltage grid. Of course, big uh, renewable energy systems can also feed their electricity to the high voltage grid like offshore wind parks, for example. Um, uh, they feed typically into the high voltage grid. But mid-sized uh, wind energy parks feed to the medium, uh, feed into the medium voltage grid. And on the left hand side, uh, what are the uh, consumers? On the one hand, uh, villages, for example, they are connected to the medium voltage grid, small villages, or mid-sized, small to mid-sized uh, companies. And then finally, we have the vol low voltage distribution grid with the voltage of 230 to 400 volts. So that's the voltage you, you know from your volt socket. Uh, on the one hand, we still have power generation on this low voltage grid. So uh, PV systems installed of, uh, on, on roofs of, of uh, households or small shops, for example, schools, etc. They feed the electricity into this low voltage grid. And on the other side, of course, the consumption uh, the households, uh, each building uh, takes this uh, the energy from the low voltage grid. So this uh, the distribution, uh, typically within a city, uh, is done on the on the low voltage grid level. There are several types of uh, grid operating and ancillary services which have to be done, um, mainly to support the transmission of the electric power from the generators of the power plants to the consumers. Uh, of course, uh, you need to transmit the electric energy uh, from one utility to, the no to another one um, and of course to, to take care about the interconnection of the transmission system. So what are the different kinds of ancillary services which have to be done by the different uh, operators uh, and participants of a grid? Uh, first of course, the scheduling and the dispatch of the electric power. 
Then one major issue is uh, the frequency control, that the frequency of uh, the grid is at 50 Hz and in case of a deviation there uh, you need to take care about this and add uh, power or uh, you, you need to reduce the power fed into the, uh, to the grid to uh, stabilize the frequency. You need to take care about the reactive power and the voltage control that the voltage in the grid keeps on, uh, on its level. Um, and another service is uh, the loss compensation uh, which, which occurs uh, in the uh, grid transmission. Then of course we have the load falling so that uh, the electricity generation follows uh, the electricity uh, demand. The system protection and of course the, uh, you need to take care about the energy imbalance uh, and with all these, these different kinds of services uh, you you need to do as an operator uh, to stabilize the grid and to transmit uh, the, the electric energy from the generator uh, to the consumer. The question is now, uh, why do you need the grid? Why don't you install the power plants right beneath or close to the consumers? Uh, this has been done in the, in the past, in the beginning of the use of electric energy, that uh, the power plants have been installed right in the cities uh, close to the factories and the industry um, and then uh, step by step during the um, the decades and centuries um, the power plants moved outside of the cities and uh, the distribution grid uh, has been established that the electric power uh, can be uh, transmitted from the, uh, the big power plants to the consumers like uh, the cities or uh, the the industry. So um, of course the distance between the power plant and the consumer depends on the type of energy, the resource you use. Uh, for example, uh, hard coal or uranium you use in coal power plants or in nuclear power plants. And um, what you can easily do is that you transport this source to the place of combustion. As um, hard coal or uranium has a high energy density. So from the economic point of view, it makes sense that you take uh, that, that you produce the coal uh, or the uranium and transport it to the power plant, and then you use this source in the power plant to generate electricity within the grid. Um, lignite, for example, as a different type of coal, uh, must be combusted uh, close uh, to the mine or to the quarry. Uh, as the energy density of uh, lignite isn't that high. You can see this on the right hand side. Um, one, if you want to get one kilowatt hour of energy, you need 120 grams of hard coal or about three times uh, the mass of lignite. So the energy density of lignite is uh, three times smaller than hard coal and that makes it um, not affordable to transport lignite over long distances. You install the, uh, the, the lignite power plants close to the quarries. Um, what you also have is the photovoltaic systems. Um, they are mainly installed at the place of, um, uh, of, of consumption. So you install the PV systems on roofs of buildings, for example, that the electricity is used uh, right in the building that you have their own consumption. Of course there are also very big uh, PV systems with a large capacity. Then of course you need to transport uh, and transmit the electric power over long distances. But one main advantage of photovoltaics is that you can directly consume the electricity where you produce it. And then finally the wind energy um, again, you need to transport the energy mainly, for example, in, in Germany, as we have high wind speed in the northern part of Germany. The big industry is located in the southern part of, Indus, uh, of, of Germany. So we need to um, transport the energy from the northern part of Germany to the uh, southern part. Um, and again, that's the reason why we need uh, a distribution grid and transmission grid um, that we can uh, connect the, uh, uh, the, the generation of wind energy uh, and tra transmit this energy to the uh, consumers. The load profile of energy systems in Germany is uh, shown in this figure. The data is taken from the Bundesnetzagentur, the Federal Network Agency. Um, the different colors represent different energy production systems like uh, biomass in green, hydropower in blue and uh, nuclear 
uh, power in, in red, for example. Um, the slope of the curve follows the energy demand in Germany. Um, so um, what you clearly can see is on the one hand uh, the high peaks um, at noon, about it's about at noon, and the low uh, values uh, at night. Uh, and of course, what you can also see is in this in this pattern is uh, weekend or even um, Easter like um, or other other holidays. So the power varies in in March. This is the, the these are data uh, from March 2020. So uh, the power uh, varies between, uh, in this case, uh, about 40 gigawatts and the maximum is close to 80 gigawatts. Uh, and of course, you have to uh, handle this variation uh, of, of the power generation of the load that the energy systems are able to, on the one hand, produce 80 gigawatts um, and also be able to reduce their output down to um, about uh, 40 gigawatts. Uh, also what you can see is uh, different patterns of the energy production systems like the base load systems, nuclear, hydropower and biomass. These are the ba base load systems. They run um, on a more or less constant level without uh, any changes. Then you see in, in uh, brown this is lignite. These power plants are also or that they are uh, the step from load uh, base load to the uh, medium load so that they slightly change their output um, and then in uh, in black hard coal and in, in this dark yellow color these are the gas turbines they vary their uh, energy generation um, regarding the the demand so you see uh, on the one hand a higher or a larger output here in this case uh, hard coal nearly 12 gigawatts and then you have phases just with uh, one or two gigawatts so these systems must be very flexible uh, today um, to uh, handle the, uh, the the energy demand and then of course what is one issue in uh, the modern grid operation is that we have volatile energy systems like the wind in light blue and the PV systems in, in, uh, in yellow uh, you see we have a lot of wind in, in this phase from the uh, 10th to the 14th of, of March. So a lot of wind power generated due to high wind speed uh, and weather conditions um, in Germany. So you see we have uh, nearly 40 gigawatts of wind power. Um, and this um, the, the consequence is that you have to uh, reduce the outcome of the uh, of the fossil energy systems that the energy production uh, fits the energy demand. On the other hand, of course, there are phases with uh, small wind speed, like uh, in the afternoon and at night on the 18th of March. There is no uh, solar power. Um, there's just a small amount of wind power. Uh, onshore and this darker blue color represent the offshore wind turbines. So in this case you have to increase the outcome of the coal and the gas uh, power plants to fulfill the demand. And what you can do is just go on the website of, of the Federal Network Energy uh, Agency and uh, take a look at the data uh, which is provided for Germany in a high, uh, highly uh, on a good good time interval that you can, can have a look what is the contribution of the different energy systems how does the energy production has changed um, compared to the situation before uh, renewable energy renewable energy systems have been used and what is the situation today under extreme conditions in in winter time or or even summer time um, and uh, think about uh, what is uh, what has to be done by the grid operators and energy utilities to s keep the, the grid on a stable level. One major service which has to be provided by the energy utilities and the grid operators uh, is the frequency control. So we have um, a nominal frequency in our AC grid of uh, 50 Hz and uh, the operators must um, set up their power plants, the actual power output of the power plants, that we get a frequency of 50 Hertz. And in case of any deviation, small deviation of this frequency, what has to be done, the actual power has to be adopted um, to, the, to the nominal frequency. So how does it look like in, uh, in a grid? So we have the power plant on the left-hand side, this power plant, uh, 
generates an actual electric power uh, which is fed into the grid so we get an actual frequency um, we have the nominal frequency of 50 hertz and there might be a deviation uh, of uh, this nominal frequency of um, let's say 0.1 0.15 1, hertz so rather small uh, deviation um, and now what you need has to be done is that uh, regarding this frequency deviation we can derive the deviation or the change of the actual output of the power plant as um, the more power you uh, add to the grid the higher the frequency gets this is uh, a consequence of uh, energy uh, conservation law that uh, the grid frequency is a consequence of the energy which is um, uh, transmitted within the grid so if there's uh, if the frequency is too large we need to reduce the power if the frequency is too small compared to the nominal power we need to increase the actual power of the power plant so what we can now derive is from the grid deviation or grid frequency deviation is that we can uh, derive the, the, the delta p so deviation of, for the actual power on the other hand we have the nominal power information so what is the load within the next seconds or minutes this is well known from the past uh, how the load uh, will change on um, different date times um, etc and then we can derive um, this uh, the change of the actual power that we say okay we know what we need to change to stabilize the grid frequency and then we can give this information to the power plant operators that they adopt their actual power um, to get finally the nominal or get closer to the nominal frequency of 50 hertz and this has to be done on a second or even millisecond base a basis that um, the stabilization of the grid uh, is also always done by the grid operators and the energy utilities and that you get one idea uh, what is the, um, the, the the power of uh, of the grid so if you want to change the frequency um, of let's say one hertz you need to change the power output of 20 gigawatts in our European grid so UCTE is the European grid uh, we have in Central and Western Europe. So the change of one hertz needs to uh, need a change of 20 gigawatts of power capacity. So there's a lot of a large amount of power you need to add uh, to the grid if the frequency uh, would be reduced from 50 to 49 hertz. And this circle uh, needs to be fulfilled um, always, and uh, the grid operators are responsible that the frequency uh, keeps at 50 hertz. What is the control concept for grid operation? What you can see is uh, the grid frequency in hertz on this axis. We have the nominal frequency of 50 hertz um, for our AC grid uh, and the upper and lower limit that's uh, 0.2 hertz. So the uh, deviation of 0.2 hertz uh, from this, um, this nominal frequency is allowed. Um, so if the frequency is 50.2 or 49.8 hertz, uh, this is still a great uh, stable grid. And then on the one hand, uh, let's think about uh, what is happening if the grid frequency would increase up to 55 hertz. So that's so-called primary control. So there's too much energy in the grid. Um, if the frequency increases, uh, there's, uh, that's a consequence of... Uh, an additional energy which is in the grid so we have more energy fed into the grid than consumed by the consumers uh, so this is rather easy to to um, get back to the nominal frequency as you just need to reduce the uh, the actual power of the power plants to get back to our nominal frequency of 50 hertz on the other hand what is happening if the frequency drops below this threshold of 49.8 hertz so um, with, within this band we have the activation of the momentary reserve um, so that our power plants which are able to uh, fed in electricity uh, very fast to the grid um, as in this part of, this, uh, of the grid frequency there's uh, power missing in the grid so there's more energy consumed than fed into the grid so we need to add more electric power to the grid um, so first is momentary reserve, uh, the power plants which um, have uh, a reserve 
uh, which can be activated within seconds and minutes to stabilize the grid and to get back to our nominal frequency of 50 Hz. Um, if the grid frequency would uh, drop below 49 Hz, then uh, there are three steps of disconnection of loads. So big consumers are disconnected from the grid as we have still too much energy which is, which is taken out of the grid um, compared to the energy which is fed into the grid. So the activation of the momentary reserve uh, cannot stabilize the grid. So next step is that we reduce the load by the disconnection of uh, consumers in three steps <coughs> to stabilize the grid. Uh, and if the grid frequency might then still drop, uh, then at uh, the limit of 48 uh, hertz, the operation of the power plants switches uh, to your own consumption, so uh, the, the power plants will stop the feed-in of the grid. They are disconnected from the grid. Uh, and typically this results or can result in a grid failure. And if we have a frequency of below 47.5 hertz, then we have a grid failure. Um, and we need to um, stabilize the grid from the very beginning that uh, we need to ramp up uh, the, the power plants uh, from, uh, from the grid failure. And so that is one major task um, of the grid operators and the energy utilities um, regarding the grid frequency that we keep on this small bandwidth. That's, that's not the problem. We, we, normally we are within this green uh, band. But in case of any deviation, uh, mainly a drop of frequency, then the momentary reserve will be activated and the grid will be stabilized. The frequency must be capped at 50 Hz of the uh, AC grid. So for this uh, stable and uh, high quality power supply, the transmission system operators, the TSOs, must keep this frequency at uh, the nominal frequency of 50 Hz. And what you can see here in these two figures is what um, what do they do uh, if the frequency or if there's mo more power fed into the grid than consumed or taken from the grid, this will result in an increase of the f uh, frequency. Um, this That's a consequence of energy uh, conservation law that uh, the, the energy there, there's more energy uh, fed into the grid, so a result or consequence is that the frequency must increase. On the other hand, if there's more energy taken from the grid than fed into the grid, uh, the consequence is that the frequency will, uh, will drop. Uh, we get a smaller frequency than the nominal frequency of 50 Hz. And get in order to get back to our nominal frequency of 50 Hz, you need to increase, on the one hand, uh, you need to increase the power which is fed into the grid or on the other hand of course you could reduce the load but uh, typically what the operators are doing is they try to activate the momentary reserve that they increase the power which is fed into the grid to stabilize uh, the grid. And of course the uh, the TCOs must ensure that there's uh, a sufficient amount of uh, reserve capacity uh, to balance our, our grid um, and um, they, they, they buy these reserves on the electricity market. Uh, the energy utilities offer this reserve and get paid uh, for this reserve. Um, and that's one part of the uh, energy market that you can, can earn money by providing a momentary reserve uh, for the stabilization of the grid. In an event of power failure, um, the TSO, so the transmission system operators, must provide um, power reserves uh, to stabilize the grid to get the frequency back to the normal frequency of 50 Hz. Uh, what you can see here is that there are three different uh, types of reserve. We have the primary reserve, the secondary reserve and the re replacement reserve, uh, which have to uh, be available within seconds or even in minutes. Um, so what is happening if the frequency drops um, from the nominal frequency of 50 Hz? First, there's uh, the, the activation of the primary reserve within seconds. Uh, this is typically done by the power plants itself, that they are able to increase their nominal output uh, within uh, seconds or milliseconds. Um, as they don't run at their absolute maximum capacity, they are running uh, 
below their maximum capacity that they're able to provide primary reserve for the stabilization of the grid. So um, this is on a second uh, time interval and in Germany we have a capacity of 750 megawatts which can be on the one hand added to the grid in case of a lower frequency or can be taken off the grid um, uh, if the frequency is too large. Then after 30 seconds the secondary reserve must be activated. Um, so this is a reserve which uh, reacts on a second to minutes interval. Uh, these are pumped storage hydropower plants or gas turbines uh, which can be activated within seconds. Um, they can fat in their uh, maximum capacity within seconds or minutes to the grid. In Germany, this secondary reserve uh, lies between um, three, uh, minus 3 up to 3.4 uh, gigawatts. So that's a large capacity which can be added to the grid within seconds uh, to stabilize the grid in case of any deviation of the, uh, of the frequency. And finally, after one minute, uh, the replacement reserve must be activated. Um, so this replacement reserve must be available at least for uh, 60 minutes. Uh, this is additional uh, 2 to 3 gigawatts. So on the one hand we can take 2 gigawatts from the grid in case of a higher frequency or we can add 3.2 gigawatts of uh, power uh, if the frequency is too small. And finally after 60 minutes the TSOs must be able to um, increase the power of uh, the, the other power plants that they can stabilize the grid. So this reserve uh, the different types of the reserves, primary, secondary and replacement reserve uh, is available for 60 minutes and then the TSOs have to uh, take uh, the, uh, the, all the other power plants to, to stabilize the grid. The liberalization of the electricity market um, has eliminated the closed uh, grid areas which are just regionally operating suppliers. So in the past we've had uh, grid operators uh, which have been also the energy utilities so they um, provided the electric power and distributed the electric power um, today what we have is on the one hand we have the grid operators which are just responsible for the grid and then we have the energy utilities which are providing electric energy and fed this energy to the grid but they are not responsible for the grid operation anymore um, so uh, all the grid uh, Participants within one uh, of this, this grid region um, on the distribution grid level or the transmission grid level um, They have to ensure the a balanced power between the energy which is fed into the grid and the energy which is taken from the grid So the energy which is consumed to stabilize the grid to keep the frequency of the grid at 50 Hertz and all these uh, all the coordination is done by the TSO so the transmission system operators they are responsible for the grid um, uh, grid stability um, and all the participants have to uh, adopt to the rules or, or the services which uh, have to have been defined for the grid operation that the grid is stable so the grid operator must be able to on the one hand uh, get more energy from the energy utilities from the power plants uh, in case of uh, grid instability so if they want to activate um, additional power they get in contact with the energy utilities that they provide their uh, they reserve uh, to stabilize the grid on the other hand uh, the grid operators are responsible that they fulfill the energy demand of the consumers uh, like the industry or the cities um, to um, get a balance between the uh, production power and the energy load. The grid operators have to fulfill this, this equation to uh, stabilize the grid. Uh, so what we have is here in this equation we have the sum of the power input which is fed into the grid. This must be equal to the sum of the, the energy taken from the grid. So PO is the, the output and we have uh, the, the losses within the grid. And this equation must be fulfilled uh, in order to, to stabilize the grid. So what are the different types of inputs? Of course, first of all, the power generation coming from the uh, power plants, the fossil ones and the renewable ones, which fed, uh, they feed their electricity to, to the grid. And of course, there's an uh, input coming from neighboring grids on the same voltage level. So if you are, for example, on a medium voltage 
uh, grid level in your in your medium voltage um, grid uh, there is uh, energy coming from a neighboring grid from a neighboring area which has to be um, considered in this in this equation and of course there might be some returns of uh, coming from subordinate grids on a smaller voltage level that uh, electricity is uh, fed into the grid level you have on your on your voltage level on the other hand the outputs of course first of all the loads so the energy consumption which is taken from your grid level so on a medium voltage level you have um, companies for example small uh, towns or cities which are connected uh, to the medium voltage um, grid and so you have the loads on the other hand of course there are subordinate grids on a smaller voltage level which are taking uh, the energy from your grid uh, level and of course there are neighboring grids uh, on the same voltage level which are also uh, use the power and take the power on the on this voltage level from your grid so that are the outputs on the one hand the inputs on the other hand of course then there are the grid losses which have to be considered and this equation has to be fulfilled in case of any deviation if there's more power um, input than the output then this will uh, the consequence will be the increase of the fre frequency as we have seen, uh, if uh, power is inque increased, then the uh, consequence is that the frequency will, will also increase. And then you, on the one hand, decrease the power input by reducing mainly the, the power generation. Or, on the other hand, of course, you could, reduce, you could increase the power output by um, increasing the, the loads. And this, this task, or this is the main task of the TSOs and the operators on a lower grid level, uh, that they have to fulfill this equation here um, to, to stabilize the grid, that the input and the output is in balance.